Hey, hey. Linda. <laughs> Linda, hello. How are you? It's good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you. How great on our little phones. So, wow. Hey, here we are. So welcome, um, Linda, and welcome to everybody who's uh, joining us now on, the, um, on our first uh, Gardener Live studio visit uh, on Instagram. So super excited to be here. Even more excited to be here with Linda. And um, Linda, I'll introduce you first off to start. So, um, oh, well, I should say my name is Sequoia Miller. I'm chief curator of the Gardner Museum. And I am broadcasting from my home, as we are all, many of us, um, at home these days. And I'm here today with artist Linda Sorman, who is a uh, fantastic uh, sculptor and ceramic artist, originally from Canada. Um, yay! now based in, uh, in New York City and uh, working in New York City principally, but um, as we'll see shortly um, in upstate New York in the countryside this summer. So hello, Linda, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to see you and thanks for everyone for joining us. Yay, cool. Um, so why don't you, maybe you could start off by telling us where you are and kind of what kind of space you're in. I'm in the living room, um, home studio, as so many of us are, and I'm sitting here in my piece uh, that I'm getting ready to put together. So this is the ceramic part of it. And uh, I'm just gonna climb out here. And oh my gosh, you are like, li you're literally in your piece. Yeah. Immersive. <laughs> so here we go. So let's see if, uh, let me flip it for you. There you go. Wow. I have a sense of the extruded parts that I've been um, kind of playing with text and bits of, uh, found objects, things that find themselves, you know, um, nestled in the piece, and, uh, and then smaller work as well as adjacent. Uh, so yeah, I just thought I'd show you what's going on. Cool, fantastic. And so how would you describe these as being typical of your work versus atypical of your work for folks who might not know it as well? Yeah, I have been working with a material in a way that is very hand oriented. The body is so much a part of the way that I have to kind of wrestle this kind of work at this scale. And, um, you know, when I'm lifting, I, I work with um, lots of uh, other bodies and the, the weight and mass of the work needs to be um, really part of the way I engage and um, challenge uh, my uh, willingness to go into a space that's unknown. I didn't know when I first built this, uh, you know, how it would, uh, stand or if it would stand so just you can see how the the um the base of it right now is kind of strapped down and that's how they move in the world so just you know making the work but also letting it move in the world and then you know smaller work that has maybe more um hand movements that are part of it so having um small tendrils little bits like um like that that are clay it's fired but it's also at risk when it becomes kinetic when it moves in the world so that's very much core to the way that I've been drawing and uh, painting and also, you know, finding objects that themselves have moved in the world. So small bits of uh, ceramic kitsch, little figurines are in the work and uh, little architectural elements, fragments that come through um, the studio and get, you know, caught up in the piece. So this is a little tile setter and a uh, little bit of <laughs> um, folk pottery that uh, shards find them uh, find their way in. I'm, I'm interested in storytelling through fragments and broken parts that so much of our experience isn't cohesive or predictable. And, you know, the way things unfold, uh, whether we're ready to accept them or not, that's the way that <laughs> right. they present themselves. And to be present with that is part of the way that I've um, engaged with material. Wow, excellent. So I guess, so I, you know, so many things you just said there, I'd love to kind of to, um, to ask you about. I guess one, one question or thought that comes to mind has to do with this notion of traveling through the world and fragments um, and thinking about orientation and what that suggests in terms of having a fixed orientation versus uh, mobile orientation. And on, on a literal plane in your work, that I guess the question would be, um, like, does the work have, like, do you know what the top is and do you know what the bottom is? Or is it continually, are you looking at it from all perspectives throughout the making? And then on a less literal plane, thinking about the fragment and the story and the idea of motion and change, like how, how, do, you, how, do, we, how do we as people, how do you as an artist understand that idea of story or narrative with the elements in, in rotation and combination and reorientation so much? I don't know the orientation when right. I begin. Uh, you know, I think that 
that um, the, the earlier you look in my work and, and as I look back on experiences, the more I thought I knew. <laughs> and then the, <laughs> right. the further we get along, the less and less is clear, I know. Oh my gosh, yeah, coming to terms with that. Is... <laughs> so having the sense of, you know, starting this piece um, like that. Yeah, wow. Um, the bottom, you know, where was the bottom? Well, this started out as having multiple bottoms. So the, the ground is never um, a really clear and certain place to start. The, the sense of upheaval, uneven ground, and moving through terrain, and, you know, clay being from... Uh, the ground and feeling ungrounded, that sense of ungroundedness happens through the work. So in an installation, none of the work stays in the orientation it was built. Um, so there's a piece here from uh, actually the gardener installation that I, I hung on to. Yeah. And, uh, this uh, little rabbit here. So it's uh, like little slabs. Oh, and wow. in, in an installation, it will find its place. It will make its place in a work, you know, in a different kind of, in a different space, in a different um, sense of where its, its sense of gravity is lost. Its sense of um, knowing where it belongs is not guaranteed. And I think that that kind of storytelling, it comes from um, just, you know, how I found this, you know, and, and I found this the other day, this little photo. And so, you know, what happens when there's, there's a torn photo, there's other parts to the story that are not part of uh, the artifact we have in hand. So the, I'm, I like a lot of, um, fiction uh, often features an unreliable narrator, you know, so the sense of I'm reading, uh, uh, listening to Midnight's Children right now, so the Salman Rushdie and having yeah. you know, the, the voice so unreliable, but it kind of leads us forward into a story um, with the consciousness that we can't depend on things being tied up neatly or understood fully or even shown to us truthfully. Wow. Do you think of yourself as an unreliable narrator? <laughs> Yeah, I think as, as humans, as humans, I think we are that um, that um, playful and that um, uh, unknowing of ourselves as well. So I'm always yeah. kind of surprised at times, you know, like the, the narrative, the narrative that I might um, follow and and find myself telling or retelling. Um, it does it does morph and change just because experiences change. You know, like like the other day. Um, you know, I saw a bear at the studio. We were talking about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we'll make our way outside there, you can see. And so I looked up and there was a bear. So, you know, in the following days, I was like, oh, you know, this makes me so one, you know, with, you know, nature. I understand that I'm, I must be more alert. So that was my story to myself. And as I'm telling myself the story, literally, I almost stepped on a snake. So, uh, you, know, right. of, you know, I don't know what's coming up. I don't know what's on the horizon. That's just the nature of um, the reality I'm trying to offer in the work. So, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm reliable because I'm trying to reflect what's around me and what's around me doesn't, doesn't appear. Um, well, it also speaks, I think in a way you're speaking to this question of what are the elements of the story that come together and, and how are you kind of bringing them together in different ways. And I think one way that comes through in your work is, um, is something that you pointed to, but I think I might ask you to speak more about, which is the combining and recombining of work. So the idea of both um, new elements coming in of elements that were in former projects re-emerging in current projects in like what happens to your work like how do you think about breakage say when when work gets quote unquote damaged or kind of changes its state um, how do you try to sort of animate that sense of recombination in your work I think that it happens through just uh kind of gut responses to material and to what mm. uh, appears in the studio. So you know, everything, I'm really interested in um, three, 3D prints that have gone awry, you know, so, oh, wow. prints. so having uh -huh. those, you know, as part of, you know, something that is combined with um, what happens in the watercolor painting as it's being cut and is being um, offered. I discover something through that uh, interaction with material that I didn't know before. And so my lack of foresight and my lack of knowing often is just something that I'll, I'll go with. You know, I'll kind of go with the floor. So where, where it's clear that the story might be um, clear on, oh, it says, stop sharing video with viewers in Gardner Museum. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was trying to turn off the comments. We've had a few requests to turn off comments since oh, it, the comment feed makes it hard to see your work. So oh, I was right. trying to do that. I might have, yeah, hope this is better for folks. Yeah, totally. So where here I might be following a storyline or just a linear element that's um, happening in the painting. So where the paint pours 
is where I'm cutting and following, you know, kind of the outline. But then at a certain point, um, I get interested and kind of mesmerized by the material itself and start cutting in, into the material. So the knife start to, starts to take the lead. So that, that changing of um, attention or the shifting of a point of view is something that naturally occurs in material in its different states. You know, when clay is dry or wet or in its fired state or, you know, it's in its sintering state, when it's in the kiln and having that sense of, um, you know, melting, but that's the way it becomes permanent from liquid. All of those amazing phenomena it, through material, um, they, they tell the story in those ways. So I'm, I'm following that along. So I don't think I'm... Um, kind of predetermining I'm going to make this in fragments, but that's how the work unfolds itself to me. So I'm trying to be, you know, there with it and, um, and let my body re respond to it. You know, the idea of our senses responding to work in um, a, a sensitive way, in a, a sensuous way. Um, my, I'm making this work for an upcoming exhibition at Mass Mocha, and my working title is the luhur, slow sense, you know, so the sense of, that's of something coming to you slowly, something unfolding itself to you slowly. Um, wow, yeah, and that really speaks in some ways to the power of visual art, I think, and ceramics certainly, were, which is a, a sort of counterpoint to so much of our experience of the world where, you know, things come at us so quickly. And there's such an inundation of both imagery and objects and conversation, that this idea of developing a slow sense for something of sort of having a means to like let let an idea or an experience kind of seep in and and take on different layers of meaning for each one of us yeah there's so many things that take time you know it's that sense yeah. of durational experience is so much a part of uh the way that i experience uh both paperwork and ceramic as materials you know things um, unfold and uh literally uh, transform and uh, change their state, you know, like our particles, our own bodies change in the same way, you know, so that, that knowledge that my cells go through changes when something happens or impacts me in some way, everything in the whole system changes. I've been talking to a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lloyd Brown, who's a surgeon, he's talking about the way that um, cells will completely uh, change their structure, you know, after mm. something like an infection, you know, that, mm -hmm. that is fascinating to me. So like one thing, you know, you turn the kiln up, you let some air in, something totally um, different will happen in the transformative process. And um, I'm interested in the ideas and the experiences, the lived experiences of healing of the body, you know, like how, how long does it take? What, what does it um, mean to go from woundedness to, uh, to healing? Like how long does that take? What needs to transform. Wow. You know, so you've, um, you've shown us a little bit of this very long paperwork that you have. <laughs> I would love to hear more about that and to see more of it and thinking sure. about um, and wondering about this work within the set of questions around duration and storylines and sure. healing, maybe. Yeah, there's uh, this long piece of paper. I, I, I got it as a roll and <laughs> I just, I rolled it out in the kitchen, which is the other room. And I just kept rolling it out and I just couldn't cut it. There was this, um, physical presence of the material that, you know, it was this amazing slab, especially when I wet it down and it would move. Um, mm. And, you know, it's easy to injure. It's this, um, it's, it's, it's resilient, has strengths to it, but it's also, you know, it's paper. I'm used to uh, uh, material like ceramic that will, you know, hold through, you know, m more stormy <laughs> kinds <Yeah>. of situations. <laughs> Treatment. So yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a new, it's a new uh, experience to do, paperwork at the scale for me. So um, wow. the idea of it being then uh, cut through and um, having all of the movements that are um, invited by the way that I pour and the way that paper flows, that sense of rheology or the, or the science of flow. And I'm interested in, you know, how does that intersect with then my work? Because it started to look a lot like um, the ways that uh, the three-dimensional works happen. And then, you know, I had some uh, poppies that uh, were just falling, their petals were falling, and that looked really interesting and kind of wow. resonant with the work. And so that's, um, that's a loss or a decay, but the color is still hanging on, that um, really vibrant uh, red. And so I'm, maybe I'll, you know, include that in the work in some way and have that ephemeral um, sense uh, happen. So when things decay and things change, you ask, asked about, you know, when, when the work uh, sheds or when a piece of ceramic, um, you know, moves, it changes its location. I have 
invited that by um, installations that uh, turn things on their um, bottom to top. So, you know, so this kind of work, you know, having that sense of uh, groundedness in one orientation, but then never um, experiencing uh, that orientation only in one way. So changing that orientation like we uh, started talking about, but then also resituating it, putting it next to something else and having it resonate a permanent material with something so ephemeral like this. And so to me, it's, it's not loss, it's, it's about change and, um, and following a curiosity, like kind of a steady curiosity about, about how things open up and how things move on. Um, this, you know, as I went from that room over there, uh, when I first got the piece of paper, there was things like three steps. So I let the, <laughs> the, I let the paper roll go down. And then this is the part that kind of just flowed down those wow. steps. And um, while I was painting, I was thinking of an actual image. So I was painting, you know, a crocodile at, at this a symbol that I'm interested in that um, is often found in Indonesian um, motifs. Um, but that's not, that doesn't last. That happens through the painting. And so there's a sense of the body and acting um, a way of drawing something that uh, people from past generations in my family have done. So that kind of the artisans um, Indonesian, in Indonesia making objects that invite the ancestors to be part of their lives and not thinking about death in, the, in, a, in, a, in a system of things that is linear or that stops, but thinking about how do we now invite the ancestors, both living ancestors and those who have passed to be part of our living experience. And so um, I've been interested in, in the word Luluhur, ancestors, and Merjojong, um, which is uh, this small house that uh, the artisans in Bachak culture will make uh, and put things like birds and other animal figures on top. And then they put that house on top of their house. And that object invites the ancestors to be part of Leluhur, the ancestral kind of uh, activity and spirit that is a protective force in the community. Um, mm -hmm. So there's this, this kind of thing that goes um, beyond loss. It's not that you don't lose, things do change and things, uh, we're bereft of things, but then they reappear and come back to us and open other kinds of realities, um, maybe in a way that's kind of transcendent. It's so beautiful. It's such a sense of, of, of memory and the possibility of memory and sort of the visuality of memory and, and, and um, opens up so much the painting actually for me in terms of how I can see it and what I can, what I, um, what I'm seeing into it and thinking of the, of the imagery, which isn't, um, which isn't immediately distinct, you know, it's not super representational, starting to be able to understand it as in a way a reflection of this kind of memory that you're speaking to. It's yeah. really beautiful. Interesting, you know, what, what, have we, what do we inherit? What, what do our cells and our psyches inherit from those who've, who have gone before us? And um, uh, what happens when those ties are severed? You know, so much severing happens through colonialism, through, um, trauma, what happens when those, um, all those, all those cells change, you know, the, fam yeah. the family's makeup changes in that way. Totally. It makes me think of epigenetics too, like how those experiences, you know, do fundamentally change like the sheaths of the, of the DNA and um, transform us in ways that we don't understand really, which is like a great reason to make art, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> hey, are, do you, are, you were going to take us yeah. outside. Do you want to yeah, take us out? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to thank the Gardner Museum for getting me to clean my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes, right? And so, hey, I hope, you're grabbing, I hope you're grabbing something you can clang in case your neighborhood bear is out there with us, right? I know, right? <laughs> I, I've uh, got a bear bell on order and <laughs> spray. So, wow. yeah, to be in the country has often, you know, been this, you know, sense of it being um, a retreat and peaceful, but um, the city also has this sense of alertness that it requires. So the different types of alertness that happen mm. through being in a place is something that really influences the work. Is obviously I'm very interested in installation and site yeah. responsive installation. I, th I love that notion of um, different types of alertness and sort of what you're alert to in different environments and different situations. You know, it can be very different. So yeah, cool. Tell us about where we are now. So this is the garage, we call it the shed. So this is where I um, will put 
uh, ceramics together that uh, can't be made on its um, on on a bottom on a base that uh, uh, can't be transported well. So what's happening here is it's happening right on a kiln shelf. It's built right on the kiln shelf, and then it'll be lifted directly into the kiln behind it. So I don't have a car kiln, but um, we have a um, hopefully a, a little uh, material handler coming that will help lift right. the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of a, a, a surrogate car kiln. Um, right. And um, I recently uh, just got the electric kiln going here. So we've got that going as well. And let's see. I hope I'm not bouncing up around too much, but I can share a bit of... Can you see that? Let's see. Tell me if the signal changes too, because we had some interesting signal changes. I can go all the yeah. way around. I think, I think we're pretty good. Yeah. I think we're pretty good. Wow. So yeah. this, this piece is built on um, one of my friends, Keith Simpson's pieces that he gave to me, um, kind of a discard from his studio practice. You can see it kind of back here. Right. With the kind of perforations or. Yeah, yeah that's right. So it's, it's printed on a 3D printer. He's um, at early American robot pottery. And uh, if that offers a kind of, uh, platform on which the work can start to fight against gravity because ceramics can be so heavy and clay can really push itself down and um, I want that sense of lightness and its ability to move around and up and not have a bottom um, not have that kind of set orientation that we were talking about um, and so I are, am building on this in parts and as it comes apart as I pull it apart um, there will be probably no bottom because that piece will just kind of slide out from underneath there Wow, cool. And so are you continuing to add on to that piece currently, or is that kind of in the form that you anticipated? Yes. Being? Yeah. Still growing. Yeah. yeah. I'm st it's still growing. Yeah. So <laughs> like I, so here's some earth, red earthenware. So what I do is I can just, you know, um, move in there. I don't know if you can see clearly. Yeah, totally. Oh, wow. This is like a little demo embedded in. This is excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, even if the piece is fired, uh, which it's not yet, it's still green, but even if it's fired, I can kind of knit in and weave in another layer of information, another sense of uh, different material presence, you know? So the white clay will offer this amazing um, under structure for color and really beautiful um, kind of candy colors, which I'm... Uh, Kind of, kind of like to, yeah. addicted to, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and uh, and the red will offer you know so much history um, from uh, a lot of red earthenware clay. A lot of folk pottery has that under underlying warmth, you know that that depth, right. of warmth that um, red earthenware. Not, nothing's like red earthenware in that way for me. Right, it's just like the ground in in some way, right? Yeah. Yeah. And are you thinking at this stage about what kind of insertions or other types of objects or fragments might find their way in there or, or even a story? Are you kind of consciously thinking of a story at this stage as you're, as you're building something? No, no, no conscious storytelling <laughs> um, has, is happening. But I, do have, <laughs> I have adjacent objects nearby that uh, maybe I'll leave you kind of close to the door so you can not lose the signal and I'll just think over. Um, so, you know, there's things like... Um, just nearby, there are, you know, pieces that you, you're talking about, things that come from different stages, different time periods. So this is kind of a cloud form uh, with mm -hmm. slots that I could slot cardboard and other straight materials through to kind of have that kind of building um, that happens. And um, that's nearby because they're kind of thinking of it. They're kind of adjacent presences. Um, and uh, this is strange, you know, duck that I found at a vintage store with, uh, you know, strange polka dot legs. Wow, nice. Yeah. This is uh, from Syracuse, China. So um, oh, from yeah. the exhibition at the Everson, I went to the defunct factory um, after it closed down uh, for the piece, uh, The Disillusionment of the Toiler. And, you know, just that idea of um, so much economic and um, cultural strain that uh, people in that area, in that town have been dealing with. So um, just kind of picking the shards out of there. So they have, each shard has a, ha, tells its own story. And so these offer themselves to the work. And, you know, if, if they are nearby and they start to resonate with my own experience, the way that I'm experienced the reality, experiencing the realities of um, contemporary life, then they kind of migrate in and out of the piece um, at different times. 
Wow, I love that sense of being provisional, that they can kind of come and go depending on how the story is taking shape or, or morphing. Yeah, you know, I I remember we, we talked uh, a few years ago about, you know, uh, archiving and, and being yeah. better about taking records of where things go and how does how does a piece like this move through, or a piece like this move through the work? And that I think that's that's really an important aspect that I want to develop more. I have I have, you know, so much personal connection with the objects. I kind of build these uh, relationships and stories in my head with them. So like this comes off Keith's piece again. Um, wow. Just, you know, so the negative space would have been in here. The piece was resting like this, but then it gets fired in a different orientation. Whatever, whatever it can withstand. You know, it's, it's a lot about um, how does the piece survive? Like how, how do we take this unlikely situation and... And, and survive, right? <laughs> and like make ourselves into something, yeah. yeah. That's really beautiful, the unlikely situation. Um, so I want to ask, do you, like, how do you ever throw anything away? Do you, or do you have, like, some other separate, like, building filled with shards and bits and pieces and everything? I have a lot of debris. <laughs> There's a lot of debris. It's a problem. I've tried to channel my problem <laughs> into work, but it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. It's in the basement of in-laws and parents' homes and um yeah the laundry room it's you know here's a bucket down here so that's just a small yeah wow that's great it's like you do have um oh. it cut out there for just a sec but it, it does feel like you do have actually this archive and in, in a way you have like these sort of vast resources that you are um transforming and channeling and it's so um so exciting and cool to see how you are um T turning this sort of improbable state that we're in into this um, kind of force of work. Yeah. And I'm, also, I'm just, you know, grateful to people who are, um, you know, offering parts of their practice as well. You know, I've like shards by Lisa Orr and uh, Yumi Horier and potters who are so much a part of the way that I come to learn and understand um, the richness and the history and the depth and the resonance of material when mm. their shards come into my um, my practice, I, I'm so grateful for their voices to be included. So there's this kind of, um, uh, you know, layered, uh, storied um, sharing of um, experiences through material. Cool. So we are about to sign off. I'd love um, to hear a plug for your Mass Mocha project and tell us um, when we can expect to see that and when we can all travel to Western Mass. Yay. Um, yes, it will be opening October 16th, 2021. And the exhibition is a group exhibition, and it will be about ceramics and the poss uh, it's about um, sculpture and the possibilities of uh, clay and politics. So the, I think the title is still um, happening. So. Still happening. Yeah. Cool. So, Mass well, Mocha, North Adams. Yay! <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing that and lots of your other work. Thank you so much for giving us a, a walk through your your work today. Really appreciate it, and it's been really wonderful and, and fantastic to hear about. Thanks for inviting me in the conversation yeah absolutely stay healthy stay safe stay away from the bears and keep yes, thanks. <laughs> you keep okay. too. yeah thanks everyone for joining us i just want to give a quick shout out that we are doing a live program on thursday at 1 p.m and around this time it's not over instagram but it is over zoom and that'll be with sharif bay should be super exciting next week at this time at 1 p.m actually we will be speaking with Marika Patterson, a fantastic potter in Eastern Canada and the Maritimes. So thanks so much um, from the gardener. Thank you, Linda. And um, yeah, everybody be well, enjoy, make stuff. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs>